Hey friends, hope you're having a fabulous Monday. Yes, off to get the week off to a great start. And uh, I actually have a couple of awesome questions uh, that were sent to me by some fabulous people uh, to answer during this live. And I'm going to do just that. So I'm going to talk about two things today. Uh, one of them is, and this is I talk about this totally just a lot. And I think that we're all kind of delusional. Uh, about this specific topic, uh, myself included in some in some respects. And it has to do with uh, how you evaluate e-learning and how you get feedback from your learners about how good, you know, your training was. And, um, <laughs> and then the other question that came up uh, uh, from uh, the group is um, when you're starting a learning project with a stakeholder, and let's say you're an outside vendor or an outside consultant, how do you, um, do you let them decide on the learning outcomes and let them drive that? Or do you tell them, no, we're going to handle it and then you get to approve it, right? So how do you do that? How are you going to make that decision? So the first thing I want to talk about is really, is how we evaluate the quality of the learning that we're putting out there. Because I talk to, I talk about this all the time, right? I'm always asking like, how do you do that? How do you evaluate, you know, you launch something, how do you get feedback from the learners? Let's be real here, like seriously, seriously real, because I don't want to, I don't want to BS anybody here. Tons of times I've done projects as a consultant where I never get feedback on how good that uh, c scenario was, how good that interaction was. Um, initially, I get to talk to some people who actually are in the field, and I'm testing with them, and I'm doing when optimal. I get to do some user testing with people, but as far as like two months from now when I've launched it and I've gone away, they don't, you know, some of those things that they're capturing as far as what is actual feedback and it was it good are actually quite terrible. And a lot of companies don't even follow up. They just check numbers. They're like, how many people went through this? Okay, good. That means it was good. So that's not a really good strategy, right? Uh, and the other thing that I found is I work with organizations that are really diligent about following up, like they'll launch some sort of learning and then they'll launch it to uh, about three months after, right? They'll come back and they'll say, hey, um, how was that? How was that experience for you? And they'll get feedback. But the problem is the feedback surveys that they're using absolutely blow. It's They're so terrible and I'm going to tell you why and I want you to know this because I um, I think that this will help you get some better results and also for all of us to just be a little bit more honest about the fact that a lot of companies don't have a follow-up plan, they don't care. Hey, sure that thank you so much for being here. That's awesome. Thanks for thanks for joining. So, let me tell you uh, what happened to me and uh, to to help me get this um, put this into perspective. So um, one of my friends works at a vehicle dealership, right? And the vehicle dealerships are quite competitive. They actually have to meet a lot of um, specific quality metrics. So every time, I don't know if you've ever been to take your car in for service, but what happens is, and if you have, good for you. <laughs> so when you go take your car in for service, what happens is at the very end of that service, they give you a survey to fill out. And the survey is asks questions that are called Likert scale questions. So a Likert scale question is a question where you have to rate the quality of uh, how satisfied, let's say you are with something. You may have seen this kind of question where basically it says, how satisfied were you with this? And it says, not at all satisfied, somewhat satisfied, very satisfied, you know, amazingly satisfied. That's a Likert scale. So they'll ask you a single question and then you have to rate it. And for them, the question was, you know, how was your service today? Poor, okay, good, uh, great, excellent. Now, the thing is, uh, those dealerships, to be able to kind of ask for, you know, more funds or, or to be recognized as the top dealerships, everything has to be excellent. So one of the things that they do is, and we don't even get this this luxury, before you leave, they'll fill out the survey with you, right? And if anything is below excellent, they will be like, hey, how can we make it excellent? What would change that? So they actually get to have a conversation with you about what excellent is. Now, one of the things that they found 
is that most people, after they got the service and they got the service that they wanted and needed, they would rate it as good, not excellent. And then the, the rep would say, okay, well, did, was anything not done properly? Was there something missing? And they're like, no, it was all good. And they're like, oh, okay, so that means it was excellent because everything that you expected had happened and we did this. So it's actually, so what happened is they had to coach people on how to answer the survey. So they had to coach them to tell them to say, You're, you, what you really mean is excellent because everything was done according to how you wanted it to be done. That's why the Likert scale sucks for using it for evaluating learning experiences or actually as far as I'm concerned for anything that you want to rate because how what your definition of excellent and my definition of good could be like the same experience except I'm using a different word to describe it. And also one of the things that sucks is even if you had a really great experience in a learning session, a workshop session, whatever, I still want to know what you're missing. What's what is going to help you take yourself further, right? And me saying, how was your experience? And you going, that was excellent. That gives me zero feedback. Like even if let's say somebody says that was poor. Well, what could I improve, right? The, the Likert scale is terrible to use and a lot of organizations that I see they're learning and I'm like, that's great that you follow up with your learners, but if you give them how satisfied were you with your training and you give them a Likert scale saying from poor to excellent, it's not going to give you any indication as to where you need to improve and what was actually relevant. So you have to work on that. You have to fix it. So <clears throat> it's kind of funny because when I first started um, training and I was a, a trainer at a call center for a financial institution, I got um, at the end of my training, I would distribute um, surveys and I would actually also distribute surveys three weeks after and we would do surveys six weeks, six months after. We were really pro survey. We were really into checking. And let me tell you guys, I got great scores. I got great scores. I, I was in the, like the top percentile for trainers. Yay. Everybody enjoyed it. Everybody had a great time. They were felt motivated. They, uh, you know, they took action. It was great. Retention was high. And then what I got to, to do, which we don't get to do in e-learning is I got to see how those people actually perform on the job. And I would get those surveys back, right? And I would see one kind of reality. And then I would look at the, the performance of those people and say, Hmm, well, they're, they're struggling here. I would actually get to observe. I would listen to their calls. And then what I would do is I would be saying, okay, they obviously that's, that's a sticky point. I'm going to improve my training by including either a worksheet or we're going to play role play that, or we're going to do a scenario for it because people are struggling with this. So what was amazing for me as the, you know, the learning designer and the trainer at that point is I was able to look at the performance that the training resulted in and use that as a really good uh, indicator of how I should improve my training, right? That's sweet. That's easy. That's amazing. We don't get to do that. When you come in as an even, even a consultant that's on the inside, when you're designing learning for an organization, very few times do you actually get to go and observe the job after somebody's gone through your training, right? Very rarely do you get to go see them and they're like, oh, they're still making this mistake. Obviously I didn't either support, provide any good performance support on the job, or I didn't explain that clearly, or we didn't practice that enough because this is a consistent mistake. You don't get to do that. And what happens is uh, you kind of live in this bubble, right? Like you're like, oh man, I, I don't even know. And then what happens is the only thing, the other thing that contributes to it is you, you think that the surveys you're sending out actually mean something, but they don't because the perception of somebody who's answering those surveys is not accurate. So what you have to do is you have to start asking different questions. So it's not going to be how satisfied were you? Uh, you're going to start asking questions like, um, out of these four things, which one did you, which concept did you find that you're actually using on the job the most? Uh, which one is the most useful? Which one's the least useful? Which one of these topics do you, uh, you know, have you, have you been able to actually apply on the job? So what you're doing is you're no longer leaving things to the imagination or subjective uh, opinion. 
you're actually uh, making specific statements about what specific statements that are tied to training. So the job aids that we handed out, were you, are you using them? Which ones? Uh, how are you using them? How often? All those things. You have to uh, start asking specific questions about the training that you provide because this is the thing. You cannot improve the working environment, right? You have no jurisdiction over that. You can't improve how people get supported. You rarely get a chance to uh, say, this person needs a mentor, this person needs a coach, this person needs more performance support. You can't improve that in most cases. Uh, we need more incentives. Very rarely do you have that authority. However, what you can improve is the quality of the resources that you're putting out. So instead of saying, were you satisfied with the training? Of course they were, whatever, like even if they weren't. So what? Well, that doesn't help you. Start asking questions that help you improve exactly what you're doing. So start asking questions about the training specifically. What was it? What tools, what scenarios, what situations were you, uh, did you find were actually stuff that you used on the job that helped you do your better job? And then you can actually um, you can actually improve uh, your training because it's the only thing you have control over, right? So that takes a little bit of time and rethinking, but start thinking about it that way. Don't leave it to um, to opinion. Okay, let me see. Sherzad, you put a question here. If we make surveys, how to make young e-learners satisfied? I mean, do we have to make strong surveys to engage students in e-learning course? What do you think? Um, Well, see, Shirzad, if you're doing it for young learners, the quality of the questions would actually be exactly the same. I would suggest that you make, um, basically what you're trying to do every time is to say, uh, you know, I shared a concept with you, right? Uh, whatever that is in, in your scenario, in your training. Have you been able to use this in, uh, like, I would ask that question straight up. So. Definitely, um, you can say, instead of saying, if, instead of making your survey all long answer saying, can you tell me a time that this was used, I would have qualifiers and the qualifier question would say, okay, think of all the uh, situations uh, or think of a, the specific scenario that we shared about uh, this. Now, select the statements about this activity that you got to participate in that were true. And, and have a bunch of statements like, I found this activity very interesting. I found this activity was something that I used in, um, in my daily life. I found this activity very confusing. I didn't, I, I actually wish we practiced more. So make a whole bunch of statements that would represent how that person would feel about it, even if it's a young learner. And then you have some data. If, so, if nine out of 10 of the people that respond say, I found it very interesting, but also I found it very confusing and I wish we practiced it more. Guess what? You now have some direction as to how you can improve that learning piece. So I hope that helps. You, you never want to waste that opportunity to get valid feedback, but you have to be strategic. So you might need to only ask one or two questions, but what the other thing that happens, which is very important, is when you have, uh, you know, very satisfied to uh, not satisfied to very satisfied, a lot of people don't, um, they'll just go good, 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 without really comparing them to each other, saying this is what being good is, so a statement that represents good, and this is a statement that represents excellent. So you have to, instead of making people decide and not think, make them compare the statements to each other, because you're making them very focused. I hope that helps. That's kind of an overview because to tell you the truth, my friend, to design great surveys is a piece of like, you could be, that just could be your profession, right? That's a profession in itself, but we can get better at it and get better data by asking better questions and remove the Likert scale. The satisfaction means nothing. Start asking questions where they have to compare, um, you know, this was, this was interesting, but I found I wanted more practice. This was interesting, but I never used it when I, you know, when I left or I don't even remember this concept, right? So there's a lot of things that you can have them read 
and be like, oh yeah, this one, this one represents me and how I feel about this, my experience with it. So I hope that is helpful. Now, the other question that we got in our um, engaging e-learning um, group was uh, this question that, let's say you are starting a new project with a customer, right? And let's say you're a freelancer, an outside vendor, and they'll have, um, they'll come up with the learning outcomes for your project. Now, it, the question was, do you let the client come up with the learning question, with the learning outcomes, or do you let, do you come up with the learning, um, with the learning outcomes? And here's, here's what I, I have to say on that topic. I've been in both situations where I've supplied the learning outcomes and I, and the client has supplied the learning outcomes, right? And that's either way. Um, what happens is uh, the focus on learning outcomes, uh, I don't actually really fight about it very much. Uh, if they want to come up with those outcomes, that's fine. Because I ask my client, what does success look like in ap like after what is that behavior? What is that? Um, uh, what is that activity? What is that person doing differently? And a lot of times, the language that we use for learning outcomes is actually very limiting and very academic instead of being very behavior focused. So what happens is, um, if you're in an organ, if you work with an organization that's really attached to the, their learning outcomes, you challenging those outcomes or refining them in some way might actually ruffle their feathers too much and it's actually not focusing on the right thing. So a lot of people do learning outcomes the way that I used to do them, which is you have a giant list of verbs and then you're like, okay, let's pick a verb and each one of these learning outcomes has to start with a verb and it has to be measurable. Well, scenarios aren't always about being measurable. Scenarios are sometimes about having somebody experience something and go th over that decision over and over again. So really the, the measurable is were you able to choose the most um, the, the most assertive option out of the out of the three that were presented to you? That's a really you know hard thing to measure, but you are actually attaching a metric to a behavior in a scenario, which is weird because you're clicking things on a screen. You're not actually in a room with uh, you know experiencing these things. But so. What I say is use your best judgment when it comes to that. If, a, if an organization is open to having their learning outcomes challenged or developed, that's wonderful. I mean, you're still going to have to work with experts and people who are practitioners in the field to decide what is that end outcome going to look like. And I got to say that in many cases, your learning outcomes are only a checklist for you to make sure that you've satisfied all the criteria in your learning experience, but they're not really useful to anybody but you as the learning designer because the the learner doesn't care. Nobody reads learning outcomes. People want to get straight to the action, the story, and the doing. So, um, you know, if you're purchasing a course and you want to see what you're going to learn, maybe that's when you're looking at it. But I got to tell you that uh, the the thing that that we are messed up in when as learning designers is that we think that everybody thinks like us and we think that everybody wants to learn all the time and we think that everybody's interested in our world. No, nobody cares. Everybody's interested in getting things done as fast as possible so that they can go home and watch Netflix. Okay. So the reality is your learning outcomes are only as important as they are in guiding your work. And so decide if it's going to be you or if it's going to be them collaborate to make them relevant and then come up with behaviors that are going to benefit that learner, right? And if you can tie them up into your learning outcomes, that's great. But really think about, hey, what's this person trying to accomplish through this? What is, what's the big deal? Where are we trying to get them to, right? And if that ends up being like, uh, you know, it, um, and I've said this before, this is a really cool strategy that I borrowed from, um, from Google Primer, which is a, a, an app that teaches you how to use Google and uh, search engine analytics and all those things are actually teaching you things. But instead of going, your learning outcome at the end of this module on search engine optimization is this, 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 they'll go, here's some questions that you're going to be able to, that we're going to answer through this learning. Here's some 
um, here's some new things you're going to be able to do once you actually go through this and apply all these things. These are some of the things you're going to be able to do. So what I loved is that they took those questions, those learning outcomes and actually turn them into questions that they're going to answer for the learner. So if I'm interested in, to, in answering those questions, like what can I do uh, or how can I make my site better? Um, how can I make more people enjoy the experience? How can I, like those are questions that your learner's thinking about and now it's interesting to them. They're like, yeah, I want these, I want to know how to answer these questions. These are great questions. These are relevant to me. Boom. Now you've got the gist of it. Do you need to l list the learning outcomes? No, once you've got these things listed, the what's in it for them for participating in this journey, boom, you won them over. They don't need to see any more learning outcomes. They don't care. That's for us. That's like the blueprint. That's like showing people, you know, like when you come up to, honestly, I'm going to buy a shiny red car. I really don't care how the brakes work, right? I don't want to see the, the, the pads and how, I don't want to see all that stuff. I don't want to see. I don't care. I just want it to go fast and I want it to stop when I stop, right? So these are the things that you got to think about. Who is your target audience? They're not learning designers. Don't worry about that stuff. So when it comes back to dealing with your client, make sure that uh, their learning outcomes are good and also that you're clear when they say these are our learning outcomes, what they actually manifest into in, their, in the learning world. Because I think your biggest challenge is making sure that there's a connection between their expectations and what you're able to produce and what that journey is for the learner and question it, right? Um, are there any decision design tips or specifications to learning outcomes? Yeah, like really at, at the end of um there are there's all these little guides right they're like you have to start with a verb and make sure that you list the conditions under which somebody's going to be able to do something like um you know you're going to be able to um uh, <laughs> prove to me basically that you've learned and and for me that's kind of how you would design a learning outcome for me a learning outcome is this uh proof that you got it that this was worth it, that I designed an experience that helped you get someplace. And so a lot of times when you think about it that way, and that's a fantastic question, half of that stuff that we list in learning outcomes becomes absolutely obsolete. Like if uh, at the end of my module that I've designed, somebody's able to walk into a room and if they're intimidated, um, still push through and make and introduce themselves because they know that that's a better decision than not introducing themselves to a stranger in the room, let's say at a party, then I know that's success. Then to me, the learning outcome would be in a future situation, let's say the learner is able to, um, when faced with a difficult uh, situation that intimidates them, they're able to choose the more assertive, uh, they're able to be more assertive versus being more passive. Like that to me is proof that they've actually practiced enough making decisions that are good that they get there. So if every single one of my learners is able to define uh, what it means to be passive, define passivity, I don't care about that. So that might be something that I'll drop because whether somebody's able to define it or not will not actually tell me whether or not they learned how to make better choices, right? So what I suggest is you think about what is it that you want them to be able to, what, what do you want to be able to observe after they finish? And that's your learning outcome. What is it that they're doing differently because of what you designed? What is that? Because definitions don't matter. Being able to sort things doesn't matter, but being able to make a better decision does matter. Being able to recognize some, uh, this option versus this option being able to see opportunities to take action. Those are great things. So that's, that's my, my mantra now is just, what do I need to be able to observe and how can somebody prove that to me in an e-learning module, right? So um, let's say the example is um, emotional intelligence, right? Emotional intelligence learning outcomes would be like, if we went academic and useless, we could say, um, define what emotional intelligence is. Identify areas where emotional intelligence is useful. 
right? Who cares? Is that helping somebody be more emotionally intelligent? That's what I care about because we're focused on performance. If we're training people on how to write a book about emotional intelligence, then maybe those outcomes would actually be helpful. Like how to define emotional intelligence, great. So then I say, okay, I, I am constrained with the limitations of an e-learning screen and somehow this human being is going to have to demonstrate to me that they're more emotionally intelligent at the end of my training. How do I do that? Through clicks of a mouse. How do I do that, right? So that's why a scenario is fantastic. So my idea is, okay, so somebody who's more emotionally intelligent is able to make uh, better decisions for themselves and for the other people but never be like the person who lies down and is like the doormat. They're, they're smart about when to be assertive and when to be docile. They, they read the situation well. So this is what kind of the outcome that I'm thinking about. So then I say, okay, can I put this person in enough situations where they get to practice being that kind of person? And therefore, if I string eight or 10 situations where they have to make that decision, together and I see that they make eight out of those 10 decisions correctly, that is giving me an, indis an indication that they've got it, that, that we're making progress because that's the only thing I really can control. So, and it's kind of weird, right? We're trying to design a behavior change and mimic um, somebody making a different, um, having a different behavior but the only thing we get to have is a mouse, right? Which is, and they're sitting in front of a computer, not even interacting with a real person. So you have to think about, these are my constraints. How can I have them show me that they've got it or they're having a haze in front of a computer with a mouse, which is totally removed from most of the things that I'm trying to teach them, right? So scenarios are great because you put them in that situation and have them make a decision. And the beautiful thing is you can do that over and over and over again and have them practice over and over and over again until you get an indication that they're getting there. So you have to decide what that metric is. So your learning outcome is what do I want to see? Then how do I create situations that help me get them there? That's my learning outcome methodology. Hope that helps. All right. So Thank you so much for sticking by me and enjoying this. I hope your questions were fa fantastic. I hope you found this useful. Uh, I'm doing another one of these later in the week, probably tomorrow. So if you have any questions, put them underneath the video and I will be able to answer them, hopefully, uh, if it's within my domain. Because I don't want to like talk about stuff that I'm really not doing, which a lot of people do. <laughs> I'm not into theories. I'm more into what have I done that has worked and is it going to work for you? Only if you try it, right? I'm not going to say everything that I've tried works for you, but if I tried it and it worked, I'm going to tell you. And if you try it and it worked, tell me because that's super fantastic. Thank you very much. It's so wonderful to see you here and thanks for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of the week, guys. Take care. Bye.